somebody standing up and say, uh, yes, we think the system is broken, right? The money system is broken, so we better understand how it works. And the other thing, uh, some people said, oh, the federal government needs to do something about it so we can actually see what will be the role of the government in, in that. Uh, but uh, we cannot ignore the dollar system for two reasons. Uh, we all agree that we need uh, uh, diversity in local currencies. So a, a healthy ecosystem is a diverse ecosystem. We need to have, let's say, a national currency, a regional currency, many, many local currencies. But uh, the problem with our national currency cannot be fixed by an introduction of local currencies. Why? Two things, debt and bubbles. If you have debt, you cannot discharge them with any local currency, right? Your mortgage, you cannot repay it at this point, your student loans and so on. So we have to tackle that. And the other reason is because of the money and banking system that creates economic bubbles. And uh, we'll talk about that. So the motivation for doing this is that I see the money and banking system as an operating system of society. And I also see it involved in the largest problems we face. And I hope in the next uh, 10 minutes, I can make the case for it, that it is involved with the increasing level of debt, economic instability, concentration of wealth, and uh, uh, loss of democracy and environmental and climate disruption. So why is it so hard to understand money? I mean, you'll find people, and by money, I mean the US dollar and the currency that we have. Uh, you find a lot of videos on the web and, you know, there's a lot of confusion. There are four thoughts or patterns that need to be overcome to understand money. And these are the four. The first one is there is no free lunch. It turns out that money is created with an expansion of balance sheets of central banks and private banks. And I will show you that. It seems very hard to imagine that money can be created simply with an accounting entry. The second uh, um, pattern of thought that we need to overcome is that money is a positive number. We think po you know, money in our pockets or uh, money in our checking account is a positive number. No, it turns out that depending on which balance sheet it sits, it can be a positive or a negative number. In fact, the paper money is a liability of the central bank and the checking accounts are liabilities of the banks. So a number can be either positive or negative depending on where it sits. The other thing is that money is a creature of the nature state. That's not true. Most of the money we use is actually private money. And I will show you how that is created. And finally, most important point, a dollar is not a dollar. Uh, basically, money is not uniform. And your paper money and your checking account money are two different types of money. And there is a, an attempt at keeping value at par, but there is a, a very clear hierarchy among the various types of money. So you can understand money if you don't understand a balance sheet, and so I'm showing you three of them, and I'll take you back to the uh, gold standard uh, so that it's clearer the hierarchy uh, of money. So uh, when gold standard was the means of uh, settling payments internationally, central banks around the world held gold, and that was their asset. The central banks could issue na um, uh, na national currency, and that was a liability of the central bank. Now, that currency was held by private banks, and it's also held right now, as an asset of the banks, and banks create their own type of money, which is deposits. And we, the regular folks, are using deposits as an count that as our assets. And we might issue our own type of money, let's say an IOU. You want to buy a, a bike from your friend, you don't have cash on you, you write a little piece of paper saying IOU $100. So you effectively created a little money to facilitate that economic exchange, but you have to settle that with the money you do not create. You eventually have to pay cash, which is money that the central bank creates, or you have to pay with your checking account, and that's money that the banks create. But the same is true for the banks as well. Banks create money, but they don't create the money they need to settle their own accounts, which is federal fund deposits and currency created by the Federal Reserve. And in the gold standard times, the central banks could not create the, the gold, obviously, used for international payments. So uh, there is a hierarchy of money, and when we had a gold standard, gold was at the top, but national currency and deposits are 
on two different levels of the hierarchy system. And I'm not going to talk about the, um, the uh, shadow banking system that in inserted another layer of quasi-money, which is the uh, assets that fund um, money market mutual funds. So I'm not going to talk about that, but it's important that you understand that the money system is both hybrid, a public-private partnership, and it is hierarchical. So I'm going to give you the punchlines, and thanks to Tom for already uh, giving you a couple of them. The first one is that, with the exception of the coins in your pocket, all money is created as debt. The paper money is a debt of the central bank, which usually holds treasury bonds uh, as a counterpart. So you could argue that, that uh, government debt is needed to issue the currency in the country. And most of the money we use, 90, 95% of the money supply is created by the banks with accounting entries when they make loans. So the money is issued in this country when loans are issued. This has a couple of problems, but the main one is that the banks decide the first use of that money. And in the last 10 years, they've created a tremendous amount of money by lending it into real estate and creating bubbles. And they're reflating another real, uh, real estate bubble right now by lending not longer to community people that could not repay the loan, but to hedge funds and mutual funds that are buying the homes and renting them. The second biggest design flaw of our current money system is that no money is ever created to repay the interest on that debt. Money enters in circulation when a debt is issued, a loan is issued, but only the principal is created in the form of money. And so there is a, an inherent scarcity of money circulation. There is more money than there is debt outstanding. Actually, there's more debt than money outstanding to extinguish it. And that creates uh, a number of problems, including the urge to keep growing the economy. Because if the economy is bigger next year, you have an excuse to borrow not only the principal that is owed from last year, but also the interest for which no money was ever created. And also, environmental uh, destruction is predicated in part on this uh, fundamental lack of the money system. The third one, that now the private banking sector has the effective monopoly on money creation. Uh, again, the only money that the government creates is the coins in your pockets, which is about 0.5% of the money supply. And this has a really interesting implication, if you think about that, for inequality. We talked about inequality growing in terms of wealth inequality, but why? What is the key mechanism for, for, for that happening? If all our money is based on debt, that means that we have to pay an interest for uh, the privilege of using our money supply. And the interest on the money supply is a tax on the productive economy that is a wealth transfer from all of us to whom? To the people that have enough capital to lend it, so rich people or the banking sector that has the power to create it. So that is at the core of our increased inequality. Uh, money is also an agreed upon fiction. I will show you that it's basically a set of accounting numbers. And finally, I think the debt-based money system is now in the process of collapsing as more and more of the debt has been shifted to the governments and they are now you know, uh, trying to um, keep uh, the, the, the pressure of servicing that debt. So what is money, this was already said, is a commonly accepted means of exchange. Uh, primary function is facilitate economic transactions. I'll be glad to, uh, I have a, a sign up list here if you want, I can send you the presentation uh, if you're interested, I'm gonna circulate this in the meantime. Um, so, you know, money, the, the money we use right now, it's basically fiat money. And uh, there are three ways in which a sovereign government uh, can issue fiat money and see if you detect which one is the least smart of all of them. <laughs> the first one is it can lend it into existence. And I can show you, in fact, I will show you the example of the colonial script in Pennsylvania prior to 1765. You can spend it into existence. The Romans did that. Um, the Italian sticks in England is another example. We did it in this country to finance the civil war by issuing greenbacks. That was uh, fiat money not attached to debt that was issued by the government directly, or you can borrow it into existence. Do you see one of this not being as clever? Uh, US and most modern government with private central banks are now doing that. So I want to talk to you about the uh, colonial script in Pennsylvania because it is a system that addresses a lot of the 
problems that I showed you in one of the first slides. So uh, the colonies had a problem because their economy was growing and they didn't have enough of the currency from England to uh, transact their, their economic transactions. And so they experimented with, in various ways. And in uh, Pennsylvania, they designed this very smart way of issuing fiat currency. They actually had a land bank, uh, and they issued um, colonial scripts, just little pieces of paper. Uh, and they issued in uh, March 2nd, 1723, 15,000 colonial scripts. But here's the catch. They lent 11,000 into the economy at a 5% interest, and they spent 4,000 for public works and to pay for government expenses. Remember the second problem I mentioned, not that no one creates the money to pay the interest on the debt that generates the issuance of money in our system. That was not the case then. They actually put an additional $4,000 into the economy by paying for government expenses so that everybody could repay their loan. And the other smart thing they did is they decided not to loan more than 100 scripts to each individual. They didn't want very rich merchants to become even richer. They want the scrappy entrepreneurial poor people to have a chance. Uh, they Later that year, they um, issued another 30,000. Again, 26,500 loaned at 5% interest, 3,500 spent into the economy. So the government was paying for its own expenses through that. And for people that say, if the government has the power to create fiat money and spend it into existence, you're going to have higher inflation, we have a counterexample in this particular uh, case. In the following 50 years, they issue money in the same way, and those happen to be the most stable uh, period in terms of inflation in the history of the United States. So it is not that the issuance of paper money necessarily leads to inflation. It only leads to inflation if it is not issued properly and it's given to people that are going to speculate with this, as opposed to the people that creates more goods and services that absorbed the additional money. Now, remember in Pennsylvania, they gave the money to the entrepreneurial poor now, uh, there's a, a study done by the Positive Money Institute in the UK, and they looked at uh, where did the banking sector direct the money that uh, they created over the 10 years prior to the financial crisis in the economy. And it turns out that 40% of the money they created, they created to lend it into real estate. And over the period of time, houses in England went up 300%. Can you spell bubble? 37% uh, uh, went was lent into uh, financial speculation and only 13% went to non-financial businesses. These are the businesses that create the goods and services that can absorb the, uh, the, the amount of money that you are creating. Uh, so these are example of spending into existence, the tally stick and the greenbacks. I don't have time to go into that, uh, but see me later. There is a proposal, a recent proposal, to have sovereign money, which is basically uh, to have uh, the, the federal government issue money directly without uh, increasing its debt. So I want, though, to uh, talk about the issue of money creation by the banking sector and also recognize that this is a, a fantastic function. We cannot uh, toss away the uh, baby with the bathwater. And what banks, five minutes? Really? I thought it was 25 minutes. I think it was 10. Yeah, thank you. I, otherwise, I'm, I'm going to be like uh, those uh, uh, disclaimer in the commercials. Like, oh. um, so I, I need to show you bank accounting. Uh, you need to understand it. So let's start very simple. Uh, you start with a million dollar. You capitalize a bank and you buy a building for 500,000. You put some cash in the vault and you deposit 300,000 with the Federal Reserve and you get basically a checking account with the Federal Reserve. Easy enough. First depositors come in and deposit $200,000. What happens? This is what happens. The money becomes the property of the bank and the bank counts it as its own asset. It's no longer your money. But what about the checking account? Isn't that money? Kind of. That is a, a promise of the bank to make payments on your behalf up to $200,000 if everything goes well. You are an uncollateralized creditor of the bank. Now, what about somebody coming in and wanting to borrow? 
Now, the old story that the banks collect deposits from savers and give it to uh, you know, people, entrepreneurs that need to build the next economy and so on, it's bullshit. Actually, this is what happens. There is an expansion of the balance sheet of the bank. The bank uh, books the loan as an asset and creates brand new electronic money in the checking account of the person B. This is the process by which money is created in the banking sector. It is a swap of IOU. You want to borrow some money? Okay, we'll swap with an IOU of the bank. And that's actually also the great function of banks. They monetize promises to repay long term and turn them into money that, that can be exchanged immediately. Uh, now, if you, of course, uh, you know, spend that money, it goes away. How does it go? Let's imagine B pays C in a different bank. So the checking account of B disappears and bank one transfer federal funds deposits of 300,000 to C's bank. And so its balance sheet shrinks, right? The, the federal fund deposits uh, disappear and they're moved um, uh, to the other bank. I don't want to go into the details of this, but just to give you a sense of how the money system works, remember uh, that when a bank has to pay another bank, it doesn't use money it creates to do that. It has to use federal fund deposits. Remember that hierarchy that I said. The banks create money, but they don't create the money they need to settle their own accounts. Okay, so how much money has been created? About $10 trillion. This is the aggregate commercial bank's uh, balance sheet in about six weeks ago. And one way uh, of looking at this is that they created $10 trillion, and with that, they bought for themselves real estate loans, consumer loans, other assets, commercial loans, and treasury bonds, which pay an interest. Another way of saying that is this is a swap of IOU. They monetize all these promises to repay with something that we treat as money. And this is the key function that we need to preserve, and it's really uh, amazing. Uh, basically, banks are doing uh, liquidity, duration, and maturity transformation. I can't go into that, but that function is something that would need to be embedded in some currency that we create if we want to replace the old system. Uh, and this is the Federal Reserve, you know, the notes outstanding, the paper money is about uh, $1.3 trillion. That is not a seniorage we've captured. Okay, five minutes now. Um, uh, the Federal Reserve is a private entity. In England, it was nationalized in 1947. So when they issue paper money, that is the revenue for the government that can uh, offset taxes and expenses. Not in our country, it sits in the Federal Reserve. And that's that. So who creates our money? 0.5% uh, is the coins. They're created debt-free by our government. 4% is the paper money created by the Federal Reserve. And 95% of our money supply is created by the banking sectors when they make loans, as I showed you. What can go wrong? Of course, a for-profit banking system tries to buy as much of those uh, income earnings assets, and they tend to create too much money and make too many loans in the upswing of an economic recession, uh, expansion and then uh, do the opposite afterwards. And we, the people, have been called upon for our government to bail them out when they create the assets of poor quality. So when a bank gets in trouble, you know, if this loan uh, is bad, that would wipe out the equity, would wipe out this, this bank and all this money that they created. In other words, when banks go down, they threaten the system of payments that we have that relies on the liabilities of the bank. So we've uh, built them out by transferring wealth from the public to the private sector through TARP, buying toxic assets and replacing them with cash that the government had to borrow. Remember the $780 billion for the TARP was borrowed by the government and was transferred to uh, the uh, private banking sector. Uh, another one is uh, recapitalizing by overpaying for the equity. I don't have to, uh, you know, the time to go into that, maybe in the Q&A. And the third one is the Cyprus bailout, which is what's going to happen next time around, thanks to Dodd Frank. Um, basically confiscating deposits to recapitalize the bank. And again, I'm just saying um, we need to understand this uh, risks. So the, the system flaws are money is created with issuance of debt, but no money is created to repay the interest on that debt. So it's an impossible contract and the debt repayments shrink the money supply. That's why, by the way, austerity does not work, as uh, Greece, Spain are finding out. Uh, money is created by unaccountable private 
entities. It's quite quantity driven by the profit motives, not by the needs of the economy. And we, the people, through the taxing authority of the government, are on the hook to bail them out. So, uh, one of the problems is the, our money is the bank's IOU, and the bank's IOU are backed by risky assets. Yeah, our payment system is linked uh, to the risk of the uh, bank's assets. And we're on the hook to bail them out, so there's a moral hazard, right? We bail them out when something bad happens, they have an incentive to take as much risk as possible because the, the benefits are theirs, the costs are ours. So how do we go out of this pickle? Uh, you know, credit creation by the banks is amazing. That's how we funded the uh, development of this country in the last couple hundred years. By, by monetizing the promises of productive entrepreneurs to create something new. And that is a credit that should be uh, treated as a common. And so one idea is to remove or strictly regulate the power of private banks to create money. Regulate meaning you tell them where to direct the credit, not to uh, speculation, financial speculation, and real estate, but to the real economy, which is not getting a lot of money right now. Return that power to a transparent and accountable process. Uh, it's an idea, create money debt uh, free, create money only when inflation is low and stable. Banks tend to create money when the economy is going down, gangbusters. So when the inflation is actually, there's more risk, they create more money. And then when there's deflation or the economy softens, they, they uh, shrink the money supply. And make sure that the money goes into the real economy instead of financial markets. So there are a bunch of proposed solutions, but um, all of them have to do with the fact that the, the sovereign government or, you know, I know it's not representative of our needs, but at the next uh, crisis, we really need to uh, do something with that and, and regain control of, of that. I have a minute now. Uh, there is another idea, 100% reserve banking, called the Chicago Plan. There are another uh, proposal called limited purpose bank, public banks, right? So if banks create credit and money, well, if there are public banks, then we can direct them to good uses. Uh, so anyhow, um, HR 2990 was introduced by Dennis Kucinich to do exactly what uh, the American Money Study uh, Institute proposed, and then there is the uh, positive money proposal. So anyhow, this was a two hour of content <laughs> in 25 minutes. If you have an, a money system that works for the people and government creates part of that debt free, you can tackle all the things that we need to do. Reduce poverty, uh, do a, have a full employment, uh, have, for example, a massive government employment program to rebuild the things we need to rebuild. So think about you know, what is possible once we get out of the shackle of a debt-based money system controlled primarily by the private sector and we regain some of that power and use it for the common good. I saw like, um, a couple of hands go up, but I'm going to ask if you guys could just hold your questions until uh, everyone gives their little intro and then the whole rest of the thing will, will be discussion. So next up we have Ben Werner from Sandbar.
good? That was, that was fast, fast, fast recovery there. So I'm going to begin. I'm ben, I'm ben Warner. I'm from Santa Barbara, California. My colleague um, Faye and I drove up yesterday. And I'm going to start by, getting, by telling you about a, a cooperative that we started this summer. We launched it in July called the Food Independence Cooperative, or the UDD Co-op for short. And uh, this is an image, some images from our first event. Uh, what we do is we, as a cooperative, we work in local community gardens in Santa Barbara and small farms. And for this work, we pay ourselves in a community currency, which we incidentally have also uh, helped create called the Santa Barbara Missions. I'm holding some missions in my hand that I earned working with the Food Indie Co-op. They're, um, they're, they're clay tokens. Um, this is what they look like. This is what they sound like. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass them around so you can get a sense of what they feel like. And uh, incidentally, the, the images in the lower right and lower left show a, one mission and the produce that was purchased with that mission at the end of that harvest day. Uh, the mission, the number is the, de is the denomination, so there's one, two, and four mission tokens. Uh, these are some images from the creation of the missions. They're made, as I said, they're made out of clay. They're fired ceramic. Um, they were fired in phase kiln, which you see in the lower center image there. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that these images that are up on the screen now will convey to you a sense of the, I'm going to venture to say, uh, sacred um, um, quality uh, that went into making these and the feeling in both the act of making them and in the process of designing and conceiving of them. Uh, there is there's a larger system design behind how this currency works than just pieces of clay. Some of that is recorded in what's inscribed on the edge of the token. One of the, um, beyond the three means that money can come to creation that Marco described, there's a fourth, which we're using, which is it, this, com this money comes into creation as a gift, as a grant from an individual member in the community towards a mission-driven organization, in this case, the Food Indie Co-op. This is a close-up of some of them. I don't, I don't actually care for this image. It's a little bit full of photo edited and doesn't really capture the feeling, but I wanted to, to get a, a close-up of what the faces look like. And this is, this is an image of kind of the larger system of both how it's working and how we see it working and how the, the missions come into being. Uh, essentially, again, it's a, a grant, which is a, a choice made by an individual community to grant a certain number to a mission-driven organization in their community that they want to support. Uh, a community forum decides, uh, is a, a form of transparent governance that decides how many missions uh, should be in circulation given their, the fact that they are themselves the ones who have their finger on the pulse of the local missions economy and the missions guild is the actual collection of artisans and craftspeople who make the missions. Um, when, and now, I went, now I'm getting to the point that I, that I kind of really want to share about the missions themselves, which is that when we had that first harvest, uh, the image that I, the image I showed you in the beginning, I imagined, I've been thinking for months about the sitting everyone down who showed up, there's about half a dozen people that first time, and basically explaining this so that they would be motivated about why they would want to earn missions, you know, sort of see the big picture. I'm an engineer by training, so I, I, I had spent a lot of time thinking about the system and I think in this, this uh, um, gathering, I think there's a lot of other, others who, like, who think about the system, the intellectual level of, of the design of a currency. And when, when I started giving this lecture, I was sitting down at the picnic bench and next to the community garden, I saw people's eyes starting to glaze over. I said, okay, scratch this, let's just go pick, let's just go harvest tomatoes. And what I found consistently over the last several months with this program is that, and this currency is that, I hardly even have to put a mission in someone's hand and they're just like, oh wow. There's something which is in these pieces of clay. And I'm reminding you again, I'm speaking as an engineer here, okay. Um, and what I have seen reflected back from my community as I'm sharing with them the missions for the first time is something that I'm recognizing was some deeper intention that I had 
when I was designing them, which is something <coughs> something at another level. And and the way I the way I'm thinking about currencies now is in three is that they have three levels. There's the physical level, which would be true as well for virtual currencies, the, the interface by which you know whether it's the ATM machine or whether it's your online banking account or whatever. Obviously, a physical currency has a physical embodiment. There's the structural level, which is kind of that, it's, you know, or it could be the bank debt-based creation process. Um, and there's another level too, and all these three levels are in us as human beings. There's another level. There's a I call it a spirit or the the personality or the character, the intention. It would all be valid terms for this other level. And and I'm convinced that our you know that our present money that we're generally using has these three levels for functioning very well together as well. There is an intent here. There's there's a lot of magic happening in what's on the physical thing, you know, the, the pyramid, the all-seeing eye, right? That translates to the structure and translates to it. What I think is the intent of this money, which is to concentrate power and wealth, <laughs> and we participate in that when we get the sort of cocaine high of getting 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 more money, right? It's 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 a part of us as well. So, kind of the in addition to I think this really exciting project called the Food and Eat Co-op and the Missions, I think the thing that I sort of at the meta level wanted to share in an audience I think we might appreciate it is that. I think we need to also become those high priests of money. We need to be working at these levels that can create that will that creates to create forms of money that have the kind of magnetism, the unspoken, the unseen magnetism that comes that, that's that's not real. They don't even we don't even fully understand necessarily that our current monetary system has, but perhaps with a different spirit, perhaps with a different essential uh, piece or facet of who we are as human beings um, but is is perhaps perhaps hopefully even more magnetic in the transition we're hoping to make collectively on the planet than the, uh, the system that we've been using so thank you very much I might be a bit ahead of time but I'm feel complete <laughs> Come meet me 
as the sun is setting under the oak tree and bring a cowhide. So, so we all come and um, he starts punching out little rounds of leather out of the cowhide, little coins. And he says, here, this stuff's called money. Leave your chickens at home, bring these to market, use these instead. One punch represents one chicken. Great, sounds like a great invention, right? It just made our lives so much easier. And we're like, thanks, and we're walking away. And right before we escape, he goes, oh, but wait, um, I'm gonna give every family 10 of these, but when you come back in a year from now, um, every family needs to give me 11 coins. So we're walking away and we're like, okay. <laughs> and then we're like, wait a minute. Um, so, so we're in the wait a minute, uh, or at least I am. And, and what, you qu what you see very quickly with that example is that there's only one way to get the 11th coin. And it's for me to take it from you, or from you, or from you. And it's for me to win and pay, uh, successfully pay back my, my debt now, my 11 coins, you have to lose. And we cannot all win. We cannot all pay back our debts. So, so the system as Mark was describing, it's not sort of arbitrary math. It's driving us into competition. It's, dri it's the creating the perpetual growth paradigm. And it's destructive. It's destructive to relationship, to environment, to, to consciousness. We're, we're all sort of immersed in debt consciousness. And, and I want you to know that and to feel that um, as I start to talk about Bay Bucks because um, it's really kind of where it's coming from for me is that problem. So kind of, Mark already talked about this, but a government enforced monopoly of a single type of currency created by banks through loans attached to positive interest rates mm -hmm. and naturally are artificially kept scarce. Um, in, in our case, artificially. Um, so when, when I started thinking about how to design a system, and I want my notes because I wanted to brag on Marco's four points about what a currency needs to be to be functional, because um, we because Baybox is all of them, and we we started thinking about a, a ecosystem of currencies. Right, this isn't a single solution. This is um, something that is part of. A, a new ecosystem where fiat currency is still still exists and we're still going to need it for a while. But we're also this is Bernard Leotard's um, advice about what we would need in a healthy ecosystem of currencies is a is a global complementary currency, a business to business currency that is designed to counteract um, money shortages and basically not be kept scarce, be be available when it's ever whenever it's needed, and community currencies like the one that Ben just talks about that address social problems, that are based on gifts, that are sacred. Um, and Baybox is actually addressing both of those last two, and I'm gonna talk about that. So we, we actually modeled ours after a very successful um, system that's been around since 1934 in Switzerland, the Swiss beer. And Chonky and I like to say that, you know, the Swiss economy is famously stable, and it's not the chocolate or the watches, it's the second <laughs> currency. Um, and, it, and it really is, and we know this because we actually have really great data and have been doing this for so long. So what, what happens, this is a system called mutual credit. So the bit members, in this case small businesses and enterprises, um, come together and, and all money is is an agreement backed by a technology. And they say, we agree to, to accept each other's goods and services kind of as a networked barter using some kind of current point system, which is all digital now. And what you see when, when the Swiss economy starts to go down, all a recession is is a shortage of, of currency. So the Swiss franc um, disappears from circulation and people are hoarding and holding onto it. And expenditures in Swiss veer, I don't have enough hands, but go up, right? So like this. Um, and so what that's showing is that as soon as we there's a crisis or we, we need a backup system, when there is one, we'll switch over to using it. And it's just perfectly available, it's there, and more and more people do will exchange value using the Swiss beer. So that what that means on the ground and why this matters is that there, there's less suffering, that businesses aren't closing, people aren't losing jobs. Having a backup currency system just for businesses is huge. So we knew that this worked. 40% um, of all businesses in Switzerland are on this system. So it's, it's truly a second currency there. And it's um, really interesting how much has taken off. Um, 
so we copied a lot of the major tenants there, which is there's no scarcity. So the businesses themselves actually create Swiss beer and Bay Bucks. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a second to give you a sense of how it works. There's no interest. As it's created, it's always a zero interest currency, and it always will be. We're committed to that. The Swiss beer actually isn't. In 2005, it started bearing interest. It's sort of designed, it has a built-in anti-hoarding mechanism, which is kind of an interesting tax code thing, which is that actually your barter income is taxable income. So you're taxed on Bay Bucks that you earn if you hold on to them, but you're only taxed on the profit that you earn in Bay Bucks. So if you spend your Bay Bucks before the end of the year and you break even, you don't have any excess tax liability, which is interesting because it kind of helps us with this no hoarding thing, and we encourage businesses to use it. It's non-inflationary and it's eco-limited. So when it's created by businesses here that are real goods and services here in the Bay Area, and it's actually regional, it's a bioregional food shed kind of area, north of Santa Rosa, south of Santa Cruz, it can only come into existence when an actual good or service is being provided. So it's limited by the natural productive capacity of the Bay Area bioregion, and it's collaborative. The number one reason why businesses don't join Bay Bucks is because they think it's too good to be true. Honestly, it's free to join. We've been recruiting, we have about 220 businesses in the network, but when we go through the whole thing and we talk about all the benefits, they say, I can't believe it. Like, how could it just be good for all of us? Somebody has to lose, right? And this is how. So basically, instead of barter, which when Tom Greco talked about the problem is you and I have to have the right amount and the value has to be the same, when you network everyone and use a currency, the concept's actually called network barter, then you trade in with whatever you've got, excess, and you pull out whatever you need, mediated by a point system, in this case called Bay Bucks. So, for example, a local restaurant that has unfilled tables, which is very common right now, or a physical product, so somebody making bottled kombucha that has 300 left at the end of the month that they didn't sell. So in the economy right now, there's all this sort of stuff and capacity that's just sitting idle because there's not enough cash to make it move, to keep it flowing. When you introduce a second system by which you can animate all those things to move around again, you see this extra capacity starting to be used and us operating kind of in a healthier economy. And how that works as an individual business, like I said, there's typically some kind of unsold that they don't even, it doesn't even appear on the balance sheet. It's like not factored in. Typically, they just are looking at this number, right? The difference between their cash income and their cash expense, their profit, and they're trying to grow it, and they're just day-to-day doing their thing, doing business, trying to do that, right? And then we come in and say, hey, we're actually going to help you turn that unsold into extra money. And this is kind of important, the hook here, because actually, I think as this being the first plank on the bridge to the next world, you can't threaten small businesses' cash income. They won't come along with you. They need cash. They need to pay taxes. They have expenses. So you say, do all the cash business you can do. Keep doing that, right? This dark blue stays the same. We're just going to help you do something with this, this unsold. And what you're going to do is you're going to offer what you have in Bay Bucks. So I'm going to offer my 300 bottles of kombucha. One Bay Buck equals $1 notionally. And I'm going to say, hey, any other businesses around town catering a lunch or need kombucha? Oh, accounting firm across town, you need kombucha, but you don't have the cash flow. You buy it in Bay Bucks, and then you owe somebody else accounting. You don't owe me as the kombucha provider accounting, but you owe the network. So now they're going to use their Bay Bucks income to offset something they would have paid cash for. So maybe they get a new website built, or what do we have on the network? They get a refrigerator repaired. We have all kinds of stuff now. And they save $1,000 or $2,000, which does this, which grows their cash profit. And that's the part that most small businesses kind of can't believe. They're like, ah, so I'm using this fake money that you made up, but I have a bigger cash profit? So 
you know, why does that matter? What are the impacts? Um, initially, we're just kind of going for this unsold, but, but you can see, obviously, what we're hoping and what I think will happen is that it's just a better money system. And people will, will start to use it for more and more, not, not just this little percentage, this little capacity. And what, it happen, what happens is that it starts to counteract these, these bubbles and bursts as, is, as an immediate effect, with, like I said with the Swiss beer, with that counter-cyclical nature. So in the next recession, when there's really no cash and we're all hurting, people start to switch over to use Bay Bucks and they can still do business and we can still get our needs met. Um, so it, it allows them to keep operating during recessions. It drives relocalization of the economy. Um, this is a little bit less obvious, but we're we're actually going into businesses in our network and saying, oh, you're you're importing that part from China, or you're getting it from caps, um, bottle caps for your glass bottles from Wisconsin. We're going to find you somebody local to do that. And and maybe initially they're just doing a small amount of supply in Bay Bucks, and then they it turns out that that product is actually better, and they're building this relationship locally, and they just switch all their supply and they pay that person in cash too. So we're actually forming relationships, money that brings people together, imagine that, and we have offline um, events as well where you can meet people in person and talk about the supply chain and figure out how you might switch that. So um, where are we? Started just over two years ago uh, with just Chonky and I uh, with no resources. <laughs> and we have 210 business. We have had over $45,000 in transactions. And we're, we're seeking more collaborators, more support, more businesses. Um, and I think I wanted to end on this note. So, so Marco said, um, a successful currency should manage credit as a commons. So we do. Every business who comes in gets, gets a line of credit in Baybucks and can flow in and out of the negative with, with no interest. He said it has to be free of debt. Um, well, free of a certain type of debt, right? So th because there's no interest, there's, there's no compounding debt here. Um, and he said it has to be transparent, and it is. At all times, all accounts in Baybucks sum to zero. So we're not manipulating it, we're not infusing Baybucks into the system, um, and you can just see all the balance sheets. And it goes into the real economy. That's the other thing he said. So all this is the real economy. These are small and medium-sized locally owned businesses making real products, offering real services. None of it's going to financial speculation. Um, so we think it's a great model. We got a lot of expert advice on how to build this. and. We're going to be connected. If you see our crowdfunding video, pre crowdfunding video, we're actually trying to roll it out to individuals over the summer. So we're going to connect it so it's not only a business to business, but a business to consumer, um, person, individual, resident um, currency as well. And I think that's it. Yep, thanks. Questions for any of the three of us? Yes, in the hat back there. Yes, Marco, I'm Mike. Um, we're free lunch. Where's free lunch? Yeah, you said one of the myths is that there's no free lunch. Oh, right, right. So the free lunch. Where's the free lunch? Yeah, the, the free lunch is that money is uh, can be created by the banks uh, with accounting entries. So you know that's one way to create stuff, right? It's like uh, money is created in the same way the U.S. Treasury could issue. Uh, electronic money in US dollars without entering into debt. I mean, money is just a construct. And the fact that, you know, uh, you know, we, we think somebody has to physically print it and it comes from somewhere, you know, when people are still stuck with the, you know, gold standard, they had to dig the gold out of the ground. But, you know, really, money can be created out of nothing with accounting interest. That's your free lunch. And, and by the same, I can't do that. I know. So, not you, not you. But so the you know, rules it's like, designate certain you institutions. You can't join Bay <laughs> Okay, so but but the rules of the larger economy designate yeah. certain yeah, but institutions. Yeah, but the free, the free, there is no free lunch. Is something that prevents us from understanding the system. That doesn't mean that the free lunch is something we can enjoy. Right. The free lunch is for somebody else, right. private banking sector, and so on. And that's what we need to think about. But it's, okay. that's not a constraint. I want to answer this question too briefly. Um, one might argue that uh, it's all a free lunch, that everything we have is a gift. Like, I didn't do anything to deserve to be born into this world. I didn't deserve 
the fact that there's plants that nourish me, that feed me. We're just kind of here, right? And it's interesting that the economic paradigm has like flipped that so inherently that it's kind of this thing we've held on to, like, oh, there's no such thing. And meanwhile, we're walking around in all the gifts. So I would say it's all a free lunch. I want to congratulate all three of you. These presentations are excellent. And I'm very encouraged to see such competent people working in this field. Yeah. I also have a question for Marco. I know you're pressed for time. But one thing that I didn't hear from you was at the end, where does the government borrow money from? Yeah, so the government... Can you hear me? Yeah. The government borrows money by issuing treasury bonds. And they get bought by primary dealers. And they end up as assets of the public banking, of the private banking sector, and to foreigners, too. So a lot of our treasury bonds are held by... And that just shows that we are in the amazing situation where the currency we can... Our central bank or Federal Reserve can create is the means of exchange for international exchanges and trades. That is... We are in a unique place. That means we really... There's no point in worrying about us getting bankrupt or not being able to pay our obligations because we can create the money that everybody uses. But that's a different story. But most of our treasury bonds and national debt is held by other central banks and foreign entities. There is... China holds a lot of our debt, Korea and Japan and so on. So a lot of the debt is actually held by private banks, banking sector, by the foreign entities as well. I want to just say one thing because when you said you were thrilled that somebody stole some of the things. I remember I had a gallery show and somebody stole a self-portrait of me. And the gallery was absolutely... I can't believe this happened. This is Marco's art. Yeah, that's
Uh, so uh, BlackRock is, has more than a trillion dollars under management, and they're the biggest landlord in the United States. Uh, so they're buying foreclosed property, uh, fixing them up, and renting them. And then they build securities called the rent back obligations where they pull all this rental income and slice this and dice it exactly as they did with mortgages. Familiar. So what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I actually have, a, have a, a question based on your question, perhaps, perhaps for Marco, is uh, can this real estate problem be resolved while the current monetary system is healthy and thriving? It, it's, sort of a, it's sort of a rhetorical question. <laughs> have the answer, but I would like to refer you to tomorrow. Um, we have a whole section called Food, Land, and Water. And land is, um, it's not on this agenda because it's just today, but they're actually talking about land as commons using um, community land trusts. And I, I watched this fascinating video called Real Estate for Ransom that talks about this issue and how uh, landlords and banks are actually incentivized to hold properties vacant and, and why that is and it, ha it has to do with the way we tax land or don't as the case is um, so I, I would highly recommend the the land section tomorrow um, it's really interesting stuff but I, I'm certainly not an expert so you know, uh, I said uh, banks lend lend money and that's how they create money they love to lend it to real estate because if you cannot pay they can uh, take your asset Right, and so what's happening is that um, the amount of money created is not constrained by biophysical limits. It's just an accounting. You could go on forever creating as much money as you want, and the home prices could go through the roof. And in fact, uh, it, there is now this realization that for desirable urban real estate, which is a limited, in limited supply chased by a potentially unlimited amount of money that can be created for it uh, means that real estate prices in desirable areas could be potentially unlimited. And that's what we've seen in uh, England, you know, prices go up to 300%. Now, if you want to buy an apartment in London, desirable area, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars. And uh, there's no reason why that could eventually go to 100 million or to a billion because there is no limit as to a how much money you can create to chase those homes. So that's why, you know, addressing um, how that credit is created and where it's directed is really important for us to, to uh, pay attention to and regain control of. Um, so. And sorry, um, and actually there is no theoretical reason why you couldn't use a local currency for real estate. And it's a very sort of long-term ambitious goal, but it's something that we're looking at and thinking about, particularly through the land trust mechanism. Um, okay, there was lots of questions. Uh, let's get, raise your hand again. I'm going to do an order of sorts. Um, okay, we're going to go in the green, and then I'll go the two in the second row next. I have a question about Speak up. That's a great question, um, and I didn't really go into a lot of detail. So it's actually notionally equivalent to the dollar. And it's actually important that, that I'm using that phrase. Notice I don't say it's backed by the dollar or it's the same as the dollar. Um, it's, it's mainly so that it's easy to price and so, and so that um, you're not entering into territory where it's like, oh, like you often do with barter, like how much is this really worth? So a doctor that um, does an initial visit at $150 an hour charges 150 bay bucks an hour. Uh, a restaurant dining voucher buys you the same amount of food in bay bucks as it does in cash. And we require that businesses keep it that way. Uh, it also for their tax pur purposes it makes it easier. But I say notionally equivalent because if and when the US economy collapses and the dollar tanks, we don't have to go with it. Baybox as a community of users can, can set some other value, some pre-crash value, and say, actually, we're, we're going to stay here. So that, that it's notionally, but it's not like we have to stay connected to a failing system. Yeah, and then... Hi. Um, this question is also directed to Kendra. It's related to the previous question, which is, how do you... Um, work in new manufacturing. So there's a limited amount of goods that are made here, and so many of them are imported 
from elsewhere. And so what would you do to establish larger industry here? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I, everyone can hear me right. Thank you, Jack. Um, there's two answers, actually, to that, which is that um, we're connected to a larger network of exchange. Um, so it's called the IRTA, the International Reciprocal Trade Association. Um, and this is really my vision for how local currencies can go big, is that um, instead of turning around, like if, let's say, one of our members, um, we'll, we'll stick with this kombucha example, um, wants to buy their bottles and caps locally, but nobody's making them in the Bay Area, which, which is actually the case right now. Um, so even though we're kind of driving re relocalization, it's not going to happen overnight, and they still need to get their, their bottles from somewhere. So instead of going to like a, the Walmart of, of bottle manufacturers, whoever that is, um, they can actually contact another local exchange, like maybe the Southern California one has one, or maybe Nevada, and it's, it's a network just like ours of small and medium-sized businesses, but it's, you know, elsewhere. And, and maybe they have to go across the country, but to the extent possible, we're trying to point them to the other local exchanges, so you're at least supporting another local economy's local manufacturing. Um, and, and that's actually growing because these there's hundreds and hundreds of commercial barter systems now that have a kind of a um, exchange mechanism to do that. So it's even though we're we're trying to stay local right now, as we don't have things or they're not made here, we can go to those other regional or national exchanges or even international if necessary. Oh yeah, that's a great point. Um, you can use your Baybox line of credit to get things you need to start a business. So, to, to a certain extent. Um, you, right now, you know, especially if you're gonna manufacture something, you largely need other investment, um, which is another talk right now, I think. Uh, fi local financing, like direct public offerings, and some other innovative ways to get capital, but we're trying to get into that space to help Baybox actually be a capital raising currency. into their hands when you expand to individuals? Uh, good question. Um, there's going to be a couple ways, actually. So you can be an employee of a Baybox uh, member business, or you can you can actually buy them, where like $100 will buy you 105 Baybox. So there's a slight incentive there. Um, but once you're in, there's no getting out. So once you have Baybox, you can't turn it back into cash, and neither can the businesses, which is important. Because um, then 100% of that stays circulating locally and can never leave. So it's better than like shopping local or just buying at a local store because you know it can never leave and it keeps staying around. There's also going to be some, some interesting innovative ways you can volunteer with some of our partner nonprofits and get some sort of Bay Rex stipends. And we're looking into ways to, to really have it incentivize good work in the community and get it into the hands of people who are underemployed and, and doing great things for the community. Thank you. I, I love this, and I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the, the beginning, but how, how are you different from a bank that's, that's inventing credit, that's inventing currency, with this invention creation of Baybox? Um, mainly because it's a zero interest uh, system. So, so we actually are like a bank in the sense that there, you can go into debt, there's, there's credit lines. Um, so I can be like a thousand bay bucks in the negative, meaning I, I accepted services for something, and now I have to I owe back to the community of bay bucks members in that amount, um, but I'm not penalized. I, I can sort of hang out here in the in the negative um, and be fine, and and sort of pay back over time with my own goods and services. So a good example is like if a restaurant had a broken refrigerator, big expense, right? Typically it would be really bad, maybe even put them out of business to have to buy a new one. Um, they, they could go a thousand into the negative to get their refrigerator fixed in Bay Bucks and pay back over the next six months or one year in food, in dining certificates to other people in the network without ever having to use cash. So it's, the interest. it's mainly interest that makes it. There's also another one, which is the money creation is done by uh, the people, the individuals. So oh, in other words, right now the money creation is done by the bank. And uh, if you want the senior Raj, it's captured by the bank. Uh, when uh, in Baybox, the money creation 
is done by the people in the network themselves. So it's a democratic uh, money creation. Right. So in that moment where the where the restaurant decided to get their refrigerator fixed in Bay Bucks, they created it right then. It wasn't in existence and they wrote it into existence because they needed it. So Bay Bucks comes into existence and is written into existence by the members as it's needed and then it you know, is paid back by that person who created the debt. I think we're out of time. We're out of time. I'm getting lots of signals. <laughs>